Marty. Hello, Mr. Peterson. Are you ready? This isn't what you uh, kind of set me up for. <laughs> I was expecting, you know, a nice armchair, glass of scotch. But most of the time when I do this, I have blood pressure cuffs and wires and stuff on me. So this is actually not too bad. This is very easy, yes. I mean, I'm taking it easy on you. But so actually, I have wanted to talk to Marty for a long time on stage. Uh, uh, for those of you that don't know Marty Edwards, he is the director of ICS CERT. Uh, but, uh, and he's been doing that for quite a long time, actually, uh, longer than many of his predecessors for many years now. What you might not know is that he actually started as a control systems engineer. So he actually understands what control systems are. Uh, then he moved from there into the security area, uh, joined Idaho National Labs, which actually does a lot of work for ICS CERT, and then moved from Idaho National Labs to his current role. And I guess maybe the first question is, when you were considering moving from Idaho National Labs into this director of ICS CERT, what was the what was the reason, maybe the most positive reason why you wanted to do it, and what were you most uh, concerned about taking that job? Yeah, that's, that's uh, definitely an interesting question. Um, I think what I would say is, is uh, it was what drove me into the federal position was uh, this, it wasn't really a significant frustration, but there was always a frustration as a contractor um, that you weren't the one making the decision, that your scope of impact was, uh, was limited. And so I looked at the director position uh, for DHS as, as having a significant uh, impact on the culture, I guess, of security in the control system community. Uh, I'm fairly passionate about that because, you know, you referenced my control system career, you know, 25, almost 30 years mm -hmm. ago. Uh, I built a lot of these systems that had passwords like password, mm -hmm. you know, system, system one on the old VMS platforms. Um, and I felt compelled that, you know, I had to do something. Now, when you ask me what the, you know, what's, what, what the fear was or what was I scared of, I think it was lack of impact, you know, that I'd get into the government and I'd be shackled with too many bureaucratic hurdles and, and you know, I wouldn't have that uh, autonomy. And so far, I think, uh, I think, I've had a fairly good rapport with my leadership and, and have had enough autonomy that I feel like we're still making a significant difference. Mm. Okay. I, I want to dive into a little bit what actually ICS CERT is because I think this is something that uh, confuses me even and I know a lot of the people I talk to because when people think, when people hear CERT, they, you know, U.S. CERT, uh, other national CERT, mm -hmm. CERT CC, they think of vulnerability coordination. Does, is that ICS CERT's only mission or is the DHS ICS activities under the ICS CERT brand? So if you actually look at my, um, my DHS credentials, they say something like control systems director, control systems security. And so many of you will remember the uh, legacy control system security program, the CSSP, which is what many, you know, most of our work was branded with when I started uh, for the lab in 2006. I think the difference for me is the, the legacy CSSP work is the proactive piece of the program, what Tim Roxy and others would call left of boom, right? Mm. Before an incident happens. So you look at that, uh, training work, the assessment work, um, best practices, working with standards bodies, you know, that, that's all the legacy CSSP work. In 2009, we started to see uh, demand for the instant response activities, the vulnerability coordination activities, um, the, you know, sort of the intelligence and law enforcement analysis and fusion activities, and that's really the, the more pro, uh, reactive type of work, which is as you, as you say, much more cert-like. 
Well, it, it was my decision. I felt that having two program names uh, didn't make sense, and it seemed like there was much more attraction in, in legislative language and everything with the CERT um, moniker, and so I attritioned out the CSSP name and kept ICS CERT. So ICS CERT is the, now the brand that I market all of that both proactive and reactive work under, both the more traditional CERT-like uh, activities and the other more programmatic, you know, activities. Okay. Yeah, I, I think the only time where we see that be a, an issue is uh, sometimes people will say, uh, oh, a CERT shouldn't do that because the CERT typically doesn't do that. But so what we're talking about here when we talk about ICS CERT, we're actually talking about DHS's right. effort in the control system space. Yeah, and, and I think that uh, in, within the department as we've uh, moved U.S. CERT, ICS CERT under the same umbrella with the, the National Cybersecurity and Communications Integration Center, you know, th those lines are getting blurred. U.S. CERT is, and the NCIC are doing much more proactive work uh, as well as their, you know, international cert to cert work and, and things like that. So, you know, I, I think it's somewhat of semantics, uh, you know, and, and you know, oh, yeah. it's just a branding, it's right. a branding conversation. Yeah. So we can talk a lot more than just about vulnerability. Disclosure. Oh, yeah. Okay. I, okay. You told me I couldn't sit here unless everything was on okay. the table. Okay, so. <laughs> good stuff. Um, okay, so I, and one of the questions that, that I told you I wanted to talk a little bit about was was goals and metrics. So yeah, I'm sure you have, a, well, I've read it, you have a mission statement and, and some very broad goals, but mm -hmm. do you have uh, specific goals and metrics um, that you use on an annual basis? We do. You can't, you can't exist in the government or, or in any company for that matter without having some sort of measurements. Uh, I will say that, that uh, it's really hard in this particular industry to, to get outcome-based uh, measurements. So we tend to count things. How many alerts, how many advisories, how many incidents do you respond to? How many vulnerabilities do you coordinate? Uh, I'm, I, I'll say that I'm not completely satisfied with, with that. I think we have to uh, get to the point of measuring what impact did we make inside of a company or how is a sector improving or degrading over time in the cybersecurity area. So we, we have numbers, there are you know, various uh, reports that we have to put into Congress and everything, that, but for the, for the most part, they're, they're counting activities. They're not, um, they're not measuring the outcome of those activities, and that's something that I think we want to change. Yeah, they definitely are activity-based. Mm -hmm. And because uh, I wrote down some of them from the 2014 report that came out, like number of tickets, uh, number of ICS products you put out, uh, documents you put out. Uh, one of them was probably useful, download of CSAT. To me, that, that was one, the one metric that at least said uh, this many people are interested in this tool. Yeah, although, although even if you take that one, for example, it would be a lot more interesting to me, um, you know, not only how many people downloaded it, but how many people are still using it after a year? Mm -hmm. How many people re are regular... Uh, regularly update when the when the new updates come out. Uh, you know, when you, you start looking at number of tickets, it's interesting. Um, I have a hard time sitting beside my U.S. CERT counterparts because they talk about <laughs> 100,000 tickets, and I have 327. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know what you mean. Okay, well, let's talk then about another area. This, uh, and it's been, I think, increasing over the last few years, is the assessments that mm -hmm. the team is doing. So you will send a, a group of people or a team out to do an assessment and you have different categories of assessments mm -hmm. um, if they call in and have some sort of incident. I guess I'm having a hard time understanding what the purpose of that program is because it, it couldn't possibly scale, right? If, if something serious happened, you couldn't send someone everywhere. You're, you're, right. You're just getting a very small slice. I mean, not even 1% of the critical infrastructure control systems. I mean, it's like 30 or 60 a year that you do. Right. So what are you trying to achieve with the assessments that you do? So uh, even though they're very closely related, I think you have to 
somewhat disconnect the uh, what I would what my team could consider an assessment, which is proactive prior to an incident occurring, and an incident response, which is you're responding to something that's happened. Even though we blend the teams and we use similar tools and it's a similar skill set, uh, I think it's important to differentiate the two. If you look at the proactive assessments, uh, really that all started out with uh, tr teaching people how to use the CSET tool. So it was a kind of an over-the-shoulder coaching, eight-hour day, you go out and you teach people how to use the tool, and we were very adamant that we didn't retain any data from, from the company. Uh, and in the early days, private sector companies really were nervous, I think, about sharing their data. Um, they, they, they didn't want that to be on the front page of the paper. That's morphed into, people would ask for more, more and more technical analysis. You know, hey, here's our network diagram. Can you help us you know, lay out um, the best protection strategy for this type of asset? Mm -hmm. And then eventually that led to, hey, can you look at the you know, packet captures off of this network and, and tell us if there's what we think we have on paper is actually what we've implemented. Mm -hmm. If you go back to what General Hayden said yesterday morning, you know, I think that, that even though he seemed to, to have a, a, a not a very positive uh, DHS commentary inserted into his, his uh, discussion, the, he's absolutely right with, you know, this is something the private sector has to, has to address. So my, my goal and the goal of my team is not to supplant um, private sector capabilities in this area. If anything, I think that the underlying goal is to take companies that don't have any experience in this area. They don't know where to start. They don't, they don't have the first clue of how to go down the security road and plant some seeds and show them the path. And, and many times after we do one of these assessments, you know, the end result is that they partner with one of the many you know, consulting companies and they, they actually put a security regime into, prof into uh, process within their company. So I think, if anything, we're trying to do the teach a man to fish, you know, we try to, try to coach people down the path at low cost to them, no cost to them. Really the cost is whatever their own time and labor investment is. Um, and I think that's taxpayer value. I think there's value for the taxpayer in making sure that the, the medium, small and medium businesses have a methodology for, you know, try before you buy kind of thing. Because most of the time, if you look at our assessment customers, it's not the Fortune 100. They already have multi-million dollar assessment contracts with, with big companies. Uh, so we're, we're looking at those sectors and those areas that may be at a higher risk, uh, but really haven't started that journey yet. But I guess I'm having trouble understanding the logic of that because if what you're saying is, is true as, as the motivation and the reason to do it, then wouldn't you multiply that program a thousand fold? <laughs> you know, because you're, the, you know, you're just dipping your toe into this gigantic lake of uh, people that need this. So the yeah. impact's going to be minimal. If, if that's the best way to make a difference, why wouldn't you scale it up so it actually could make a difference? Can I have you come to the hill with me and, and talk to my appropriators? And <laughs> well, no, I, I just, uh, but I'm curious. So I would say that, that uh, we are scaling. The assessment program is one of the areas uh, over the years that's got a lot of positive attention uh, in my leadership and on the hill for, I think, deriving value. So they tend to fund things that they can attach mm -hmm. value to. Uh, we're trying to explore things like remote assessments. So we would, you know, have a capability where you have a limited physical presence in the field, but have kind of the, the call center in the background mm -hmm. and those kinds of things. So scalability is always a challenge. Uh, we also, I think, are, are looking at um, assessments with other departments and agencies, you know, so that we can, we can leverage each other's capabilities, and especially if they have a subject matter expertise in a particular sector. Mm. But yeah, scalability is one of the big challenges. I mean, you look at thousands and thousands and thousands of substations, you know, Marty's little four or six person team for assessments doesn't really make much of an impact there. But I think if you, if you are selective about who you do the assessments with, and then we um, 
educate in uh, anonymized or aggregate product that comes out that explains in all of these assessments, you know, 10 assessments in a given sector, nine of them were, uh, you know, poor remote access, directly internet connected devices, no patch management. I mean, I, I think those kinds of metrics are important. We're trying to get better at the publication of them, but I, I think that for both the government's awareness of where the relative uh, cybersecurity bar is and for the private sector to, to go, oh yeah, well we clearly need to invest in this area, I think, I think it's a good thing. Yeah, that certainly you could do with the sampling approach, right? Mm -hmm. You could say, we're gonna yeah. visit these sites and these sectors, get some information, yeah. and then publish guidance for a variety of people. That, that certainly you know, doesn't need the scale. Uh, the other area related to that, and I'm, I'm glad you made the distinction, so you talk about assessment and you talk about incident response. And sometimes I wonder if the really juicy incident response don't make the monitor publication that you guys put out, because uh, I was just looking through some of the incident response recently, and the one that always catches uh, my attention is it was on the front page, actually the lead article on one of your monitors, that's the uh, quarterly, right, publication that you put out about once a quarter, three or four times a year. Yeah, it's based on content, I would say. Yeah. So when we feel we have enough content to fill the seven pages, we, we publish, right? Right. But it, so it, it said there was a water utility that had a network flood, so too much traffic on their network, so things weren't working. And you sent a team out there, and it was basically because their switches and routers were misconfigured. So. What? You've never seen that, have you? Where well, a control system had a misconfigured network. No, but I, I mean, it's, it's very common, and I just wonder, you know, how do you decide what to go out to? I mean, that, that would be just basic networking. That, that hardly seems like something that, you know, the, yeah. the, the experts that we, that we hope and expect are in your organization should spend their time on. Yeah, it's difficult. Uh, so there's, there's multiple factors if you look into how we would triage an incident. And we actually have uh, or are developing a uh, methodology to score the criticality of the incident based on sector impact, context of the, what the company does or what the organization does, and uh, you know, the type of attacker, you know, things, things that, uh, you know, is the product or service that that company that uh, produces affected. You know, it's interesting, we had an issue where another department scored something very high, uh, and they phoned me, you know, in the middle of the night, and, I, and the first question I asked was, you know, well, and it wasn't in this particular case, but mm. is the water still on? Mm -hmm. They hadn't asked that question, so how do, you, how do you score something if you haven't asked if the core service is impacted? So I think there's some training uh, or some opportunity there. Uh, there's also, uh, you know, I think there's a certain amount of benefit in having, um, you know, if you're a fire fireman, you do exercises and drills, and so it's good practice to go out on, on even a little fire sometimes uh, so that you're ready for when the big one comes. Uh, I would also say that similar to the assessment work, the, uh, some companies, you know, they, they reach out to us because they don't, they don't know where to start. They've, they think they're having something. They may or may not have uh, a full-time security engineer. In the case of a small water company, they may or may not have a full-time control system engineer. So they have very limited resources. And in, in that case, I think our job is to educate them that says you need to put more full-time resources on the management, health, care, and feeding of this network. So, you know, not all of those instances that you see counted in the monitor, uh, I, I think is a good distinction, are these boots on the ground right. sending a team, right? This, this may be a telephone call that, that my staff had with them. Uh, so we, we try to scale appropriately, and sometimes it's, it's hit or miss as, as things come in, and I, I would suspect it's the same in, in some incident response companies, you know? If you've got the you know, uh, it was Airbus talking about their nine-year backlog. You know, if you've got a nine-year backlog, you're fairly selective about mm -hmm. what you're doing. But if there's gaps in that backlog, you tend to fill them with, with the lower priority stuff. So when uh, a call comes in, uh, 
that someone has a problem or thinks they have an incident, uh, how do you decide whether to go, or who decides, and, and how do you decide whether to send boots on the ground? Uh, I'd think that there's a certain amount of pre-deployment analysis that, that goes on. Uh, ultimately, if I'm looking at, it's my call, ultimately, if my staff don't feel like they have uh, enough information to make that recommendation. But we're, we're, look, we're looking at what are things we haven't seen before? So what's the next, uh, you know, APT-type campaign? Uh, we're looking at things that have national security implications. So how, how do these seemingly disconnected uh, events in three different sectors, how, how, what commonality do they have? And if we have a gap in that knowledge, we may go out on what is seemingly like a uh, fairly insignificant you know, incident, but it's because we're looking to you know, fill a piece of that puzzle mm -hmm. that we don't understand. How, what's the mechanism that this uh, particular malware is getting dropped? And we may have had the malware sent to us by other entities, but oh, this, this one little company over here actually has the dropper and, and understand how that has. So there, there is a lot of analysis that goes into it. Uh, some of it, it, it can definitely get political. Uh, we've been, I, I would say that there are certain times when certain incidents get, get publicized very um, widely in the media, uh, you know, and I'll, I'll go back to one that happened, oh, a number of years ago, I don't know exactly how long now, but if, if, if you remember back to, there was an Illinois, uh, Springfield, oh, Illinois yeah. water incident. Yeah. You know, and this was the one where uh, very significant media coverage, there was a, uh, a leak of an internal law enforcement document where they had um, you know, documented, hey, we think there's, there's attackers or hackers in this network, and they destroyed this pump, and you know, people are hacking in and destroying water pumps. So it turned out the pump failed regularly every year because of the rust in the water. But we had to go out and and get on site to get that data to, to spin down that, that uh, attention. So one of the other things when I look at your incident statistics, um, and, and you have to read between the lines obviously because you can't list every exact detail, uh, who was attacked or who thought they were attacked and what happened. But if I'm reading between the lines, it seems to me that most of the incidents are happening on the business or corporate network that you're responding to. Am I getting that right or am I, am I reading between the lines incorrectly? I don't think you're necessarily reading incorrectly uh, and we do need to get more definitive in where uh, specifically the incident happened, you know, what layer of the network. Um, I'll say we, we respond to both, so uh, and the trend it, over the past year or so is that attackers are getting um, lower into that network. So we're seeing more and more events that are affecting the actual control system uh, network rather than the enterprise network. But if you think about, um, you think about some of the things that General Hayden was talking about with intellectual property theft, um, exfiltration of key data, it's just as interesting to me when a control systems engineer has had a phishing attack on their corporate email and there's a mass exfiltration of control system documentation, username, passwords, network diagrams, to me that's an interesting incident to respond to, to understand how and why the attackers went after that specific piece of information. Uh, just as interesting as you know, there's a piece of malware floating around inside the control system network, uh, regardless of how it got there. So, so we respond to both. Um, I think I'm accurate in saying that we see more and more that are gaining access to that control system uh, layer, mainly because more and more people are connecting that control system layer directly to the internet. Uh, uh, you know, Shodan and, and, and other things. I think the campaigns that we've seen lately, uh, I'm very dismayed at, at the accessibility of some of these networks. I mean, people have been preaching segregation, uh, separation of those networks for so long, and they're just hanging right off the tubes, right? So, hope that answers your question. We no. do, we do both, uh, and I'd like to see again in the reporting a better distinction or differentiation. 
Yeah, there certainly is value. I mean, a lot of the access to the control systems comes through the business network, so I can see that. I think where it, where it gets a little tougher is if there isn't a control system aspect to it. So if someone is just uh, you know brute forcing SSH, yeah, uh, that that doesn't really seem like something we should worry about in the well any more than you would worry about it normally. <coughs> but that's not really an, necessarily an ICS specific incident just because the owner operator happens right. to have an ICS. And we would we would typically once we find that there isn't really a control system connection, push that over the fence to US cert yeah. and let them handle that. And similarly if they're working on something uh, and they discover there's an ICS sort of context to it, we have a process in place to to pitch them back and forth over the fence. Uh, historically I think you would see that m regardless of if there was an ICS involved because of ICS certs uh, subject matter awareness in the critical infrastructure sectors, we got pulled into more and more of those uh, types of cases. So just because the company had a critical infrastructure presence, uh, we were the ones getting the phone calls instead of US cert. We're, we're working to better triage that up front. This might be a good time to, to ask the competition question. Uh, so obviously there's companies out in the audience that do. Is this where the wires come out? Incident response. Um, you know, we do assessments as do others in the audience. There's people that do training. Um, and, and they've actually, I would say, have gotten quite good at it. You know, maybe mm -hmm. seven years ago that, that didn't really exist, but now that exists. So uh, why should the government be doing these things for free <laughs> that when the, the big companies basically should be paying people, if, if that service is available. Too bad this wasn't in Vegas. I could have put money on you asking me that question. Uh, I would say that, that you have seen in the past uh, us attrition out of, of areas where there was, there was good capability. I, I still don't believe that there is enough uh, capability, and this is part of the scalability problem, right? You know, if companies are coming to us saying that they, you know, they, that they, they value these services, I, there's, there's always going to be a place, I think, where uh, we can play the national security card, that there's an interest uh, in obtaining this data through direct assessment, and there's an interest in making sure we're training uh, the right folks but I go back to the assessment discussion, and I, f I firmly believe that uh, if you looked at some of the individual pick an incident response, you know, the government isn't going to go out to a s certain company and do all of the incident response work. I'm not your contract, you know, incident response company. We may come out for a specific reason if there's a uh, related to a campaign that we're trying to evaluate or, you know, as that sort of initial, uh, initial discussion, the company doesn't know where to start. But I think if you pulled back the covers, what you would see more often than not is we go out on an assessment, we, we provide the report, we sit down and talk to the CEO or we, we come in and we talk to the board. You come back six months later, I bet one of these companies is, is in that, that company now doing that, uh, you know, kind of uh, contract-based stuff. So uh, I, I actually would take an opposing view that it's not necessarily competition, that it's more, uh, we drive more business to the consultant world uh, than we take away. So we should be paying you then, right? Well, Mar you do. Mar Mar we <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> you do. If you're a U.S. citizen and pay taxes, you, you, certainly, uh, no, you certainly are paying me. I appreciate that answer. I, I would I would have been uh, I would have heard about it all day if I didn't ask you that question. So uh, I, I did want to get an understanding because this is really something we have no view of: is how do the higher levels of the U.S. government, both DHS, executive branch, um, you know, White House and DOD and all the other organizations, how well do they understand the ICS security problem? <laughs> wow. Um, not that well. Uh, I think one of the things uh, you'd asked me before, what keeps me, you know, what keeps me in the government kind of thing, or uh, there's still, it, it still amazes me 
when I walk into some of these meetings that there, there's, I think there's a general awareness. So people understand that there's these systems that operate our critical infrastructures, whether they're private sector owned, whether they're government owned facilities. Uh, they understand that there's weaknesses and vulnerabilities around them, but that's about as far as it goes. And, and having to take them through that thought process, um, you know, to explain to them that if you have a human machine interface that happens to have a specific piece of malware on it that gets uh, wiped by some sort of wiper uh, mechanism, that shouldn't shut down that infrastructure. If the control system engineers did their job right and built the system uh, appropriately, that kind of functionality, you know, isn't a apocalyptic kind of thing. And, and that's one of the challenges that, that I think I have in my career is, is the media is so, so hungry for, you know, cyber Armageddon, cyber attack, that I'm constantly having to spin down leadership, Congress, the White House on, uh, okay, let's look at the facts. Here's what we know. Here's what we don't know. Here's what we think. And, and walk through that. Um, there's, there's pockets. I mean, I, I, every once in a while I'm, I'm surprised or and I'm impressed when I go into a depart department or agency and they have some very significant control system security talent in a, in a little niche or a little pocket. But for the most part, uh, we're no different than the private sector and, and there's, some, there's some lacking there. Is there a plan this year to try to address that? Well, I'm not uh, read into the plans of the entire government, right? But I think that I continually try to address that. Uh, I think that ICS CERT and my team certainly is held in high regard um, internally in the U.S. government and, and internationally with our CERT to CERT friends, uh, many or several of which are who are here. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, uh, you know, it's a continual messaging, right? It's it's it's, it's repetitive. Uh, and it's, uh, you know, it's different. And I think that's, you know, sometimes people ask me, well, why, why, I, why ICS CERT, you know, why, you know, why not the CERT CCs of the world? Yeah. And it's because we have that domain expertise and we have the ability to explain in engineering terms, this is what's going to happen if these are the inputs, right? These are the triggers. And to be fair, uh, every industry sector in addition to the government is having the same challenge, but it's... Yeah. You know, I, th I think you're right, ICS CERT is uh, the organization the government looks to mm -hmm. as the expert and where the information would come from and the messaging. Yeah. Now, distributing that messaging, getting buy-in, that's, that's yeah. a challenge we all face. Yeah, and a good example of that, I think, is um, there's a real awakening going on in the federal government right now, um, at least in the U.S. federal government. It's like, oh, yeah, we have some of these systems, too. So you think about things like building automation and, and uh, medical devices that Billy Rios was, was working on. Um, more and more departments and agencies are calling me going, we need help. We need to figure out how to assess, you know, X thousand buildings that are all federal owned and operated buildings for, you know, vulnerable heating, ventilating, air conditioning systems or, or what have you. And so I actually see a fairly uh, significant opportunity, I guess, for ICS CERT. We've mostly been private sector focused just by the nature of where we came and, and, and that, but I, I see us uh, turning to the federal government a lot more to get, to get our own house in order. Uh, I want to make sure, I, I, I didn't want to spend too much time on it because uh, it, it's kind of inside baseball, but when we talk about the actual classical CERT activities of ICS CERT, uh, dealing with vulnerabilities as they're brought in, coordinating mm -hmm. them, issuing advisories and alerts. Uh, when ICS CERT was first envisioned, the idea was, I believe, that U.S. CERT or CERT CC would do most of the stuff, and then if they needed some level two or level three support, they, they could get that from an organization mm -hmm. that eventually became ICS CERT. Um, and, and that's, that seems to make a lot of sense because we all know these are, there are some special things and things like loss of view, loss of control is, is a little yep. different than what you would deal with in a normal CERT. But now when I look at the product you put out, it seems like there's, with, with a few exceptions, you, I would say over the last two years there's been one or two cases where you really dove deep, but 
in most of the cases, we see a very similar alert or advisory from some vulnerability in a web browser on a PLC made in China. Mm -hmm. You know, that's really not used anywhere in the world except China. And uh, let's say a, a piece of software that's used in half the refineries in the United States and maybe a third in the world. Uh, I, I, I always worry that the level of expertise that you have is, is not being applied to the things that are most important. In, is there that granularity? Or is there something going on, going on behind the scenes that's actually doing a lot more work on those in the coordination and investigation part? Um, or, or is it just, you know, treat them all the same? I would say, that I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say that they're all treated the same. So yeah, there is, there, there is some uh, effort going on to, similar to the incident response, right? Triage what's important. Uh, but I'll also say in the vulnerability coordination world, you know, we, we can only report on what's reported to us. Uh, so, you know, to a certain extent, we're uh, at the whim of the research community, um, you know, beholden to the research community on what, what they're targeting. So the reason why you see more of the, you know, web browser type is that's where the research is happening. Uh, and, and I think there's reasons for that, and I think they've been discussed in, in these type of fora before, and that's that they're the low cost, easy to obtain, you know, go buy the device on eBay, download the software trial version from the manufacturer's website, where it's more difficult to get a hold of a significant value control system that may be in half the refineries, for example, in the United States. So there's that aspect. Um, sort of differentiating what we do versus, uh, you know, the CERT CC type of model. I would say that, you know, the government will um, hire uh, contracting uh, organizations, including SEI, which runs uh, CERT, CERT CC and MITRE and companies like that, or companies, you know, uh, laboratories, national laboratories like Idaho. Uh, based on where, where that need and where that talent pool is. I think what happened is you saw uh, there's much more context that's still needed in this area. And, you know, we're, I th we're one of, and I can't remember the number, but one of literally a handful of certs uh, within the, the cert fabric that we have our own pool of CVEs with, with cert CC. So we don't have to phone them up and we, mm. we have a list. We just, we assign them within the block. Uh, I think people would also be surprised at how much work goes on behind the scenes with, with CERT CC, I mean, from a co coordination perspective. Uh, but in the control system space, there's still, uh, even if it looks like it's the same for a number of these vulnerabilities, a control system engineer or somebody with some domain expertise has to look at it to make that evaluation on, oh, this is an important one or, oh, this is sort of the normal one. Uh, we're, we're seeing more and more of the routine ones, I think. Um, but every once in a while, one of those significant ones comes up that, uh, you know, uh, you have to make sure you have the talent to catch that. So uh, I think that's especially true. And, you know, you should ask guys like Billy this question. But if you, if you, we start to branch into these, uh, you know, as, as we start to go towards the internet of, of everything, right? Everything's connected to everything, and medical devices and, you know, uh, vehicles, automobiles, et cetera. The domain expertise that ICS CERT has and the reputation we have for being able to explain to the manufacturer in engineering terms how they've made this vulnerability occur. Uh, that's a level of service that you don't tend to get from one of the mainstream IT like certs you know they're, they're more about is it scored properly have we you know got the right information and if we pushed it into the NVD and then it's done I mean there's there's little follow-up but uh, when you have researchers that still have a hard time who do I call in this company they don't they don't have a security point of contact or the companies are still uh, lawyering up, you know, and, and going, uh, hey, you know, here's our legal department. We can still play a very effective and I think needed role 
in helping the research community access the right, right players inside the vendors, and then adding that engineering expertise or domain knowledge to it. So I, still, I think it's different. I still think it's different, and I still think it's needed. Well, I could see, so there's a, a coordination job, and, mm -hmm. and that's, you know, that, that probably is you only go so deep in a coordination job. Is there something that we're not seeing behind where you get, let's say you get 100 of these things come in and you say these are the three most uh, important vulnerabilities for affecting you know, the American economy or the American critical infrastructure, and then those get passed to another team that does something else, or, or does it just end at that coordination? I, I think that within the team, we certainly have different, um, you know, work groups, I guess that I'd call them. Uh, so, yeah, if something rises to a certain level, it's going to get more analytics behind it, uh, you know, analytics where we'll reach back to the vendors uh, or the whole vendor community, you know, if you have a syst uh, more of a systemic type of issue, you know, if it's, uh, uh, for example, one of these protocol stacks that's used ubiquitously in a number of products, you know, we've, we've convened multi-vendor conference calls where we'll explain the impact of this to multiple vendors. And so those types of things, I think, are, uh, you know, when we kind of trip that threshold. Uh, I've been, you know, I, I, I would really like to see us, and it's, it's not an easy uh, challenge. I had some interesting conversations with, with uh, industry stakeholders, end user companies uh, while, I'm, while I'm here this week. How do we articulate more clearly in those alerts and advisories what, what not necessarily what layer in the ISA model or, or IEC model now, um, but is this in the DMZ typically? Is this you know, in the control field level to give them an indication of how difficult or complex it's going to be to mitigate? And then also, uh, we're, we're, we're working on trying to figure out how do we categorize um, the level of capability of the threat actors that are exploiting these particular vulnerabilities. So in the case of some of our campaign documentation where we put out, hey, here's all the black energy documentation, how do we make sure that people understand that, hey, these, the, the, the people who are using these tools are among the most capable in the mm. world, you know, vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, another campaign that may be more uh, crimeware type of oriented or something that you can say, well, you know, they're, they're a little down the scale. Because I need to be able to succinctly communicate uh, the criticality and importance of each of these things. I, I don't think we're there yet. We're, that's an evolving area. And I don't think you would see that type of analysis from a, uh, you know, a typical, just the normal IT type of cert. You mentioned there uh, one of the things that's kind of a, a source point, sore point with us is this uh -oh. idea of... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Good. When, this is my job to make you uncomfortable. When a, when a vulnerability comes up in a in a library or a protocol stack or something that comes out, uh, we we dealt with Codasys obviously with some of the work that yeah. Reed did. The the alerts and advisories just mention the module and they don't mention the hundred companies and products that use that. Um, is is there an effort to try to do that in the future, or or why do you stop there? I would say that we report what we know, um, and often, you know, the you know pick pick your um, supplier company, your your stack supplier company. They don't always know where their product is deployed, uh, and so it's we're kind of. Uh, I wish I had a little bit better of a uh, insight into either where products are deployed or what specific. Uh, subcomponents are included. You're getting into the whole supply chain conversation. Uh, it's not perfect. I'd say we, we, we will publish what the researcher and the vendor jointly bring to us as, as the information for that product. And it's somewhat of a bandwidth. This is a scaling problem too. I mean, we, we, I would love to be able to scale up kind of some of the back office analytics to be able to push into that that, that gives uh, people, uh, gives our stakeholders, both my leadership and, and government stakeholders and the uh, industry people, more insight into where is this deployed, 
how is it used, what context does that, that have? You know, so uh, I, take, I take your criticism uh, very positively. I mean, I think that that's, it's, it's a good thing to look forward to as we, we mature and get better. Uh, and there's always room for improvement, and I'm telling my guys that. I mean, they would, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not going to let them off easy, right? So we, we need to figure out how to get better uh, information in some of those cases. And we've had vendors come to us and go, you know, the reason that we self-disclose is because we haven't got a clue where our product is. You're how we disclose to our customers. We have other vendors that come to us and say, we know exactly where every serial number is of every product, so we don't have to disclose to you because we'll do that disclosure. And uh, I think somewhere in between, there's a balance. Uh, it looks like we're out of time, so I can't ask you the question about your role in Stuxnet. Uh, we'll, we'll have to ask that for the next interview. You're breaking up. <laughs> but uh, I really, I really want to thank you for being a good sport, coming out here, answering the questions, and uh, please, give, please give Marty Edwards a round of applause. Thank you.